So the middle part of grieving is called review and relinquishment. This is the time of great cathartic energy. It is the painful bit by bit letting go. One of the things that Freud talked about in grief is that there is ambivalence in all human relations. This was something, again, that he was very ahead of the curve on. And in recognizing some of these painful truths, he was able to get to people's reasoning for not doing their grief work. And one of the reasons is because there is ambivalence in all human relations. Even if you adored this person, I know my late husband, I had 99.9% of what I felt toward Michael was good and wonderful. But there was a 0.1% of ambivalence or things about him I didn't like. When he drove like a maniac, he used to make me nuts. But all human relationships are ambivalent. And when somebody has died, we have a lot of trouble with that ambivalence. We don't really know what to do with it. Many times we're raised with don't talk ill of the dead, which is not What we need to be doing, especially if we've come to the point where we have to resolve our relationship with somebody who has passed on and that person wasn't very nice to us, we have to talk ill of the dead. I made an entire career talking ill of my ex-husband and he's not around anymore, but he did what he did and was what it was and I get to talk about it. My life, my experience, my responsibility. I need to know what it is that I was doing and how I was doing it and and what my part was in all of this. But first, you have to understand that even if you had a wonderful relationship with somebody, there were things about that person that you don't particularly like. One of the hardest things that people have to deal with when they're dealing with the great emotions of grief, which is the middle phase, the review and relinquishment. When people are dealing with that, it's very hard for them to come across the ambivalence to say, you know, I really didn't like this about them or I really didn't like that about them or, you know, I... I, I'm sad that we're broken up and I wish I still had the the relationship back. But I'll tell you, this one thing over here, I don't miss that at all. You know, something like that. It's really important for people, especially when, when somebody has passed on, to understand that there's ambivalence in the human relationship. It is inherent in all human relations. And many times when we come face to face with our own ambivalence about somebody else, we have trouble moving forward. That's one of the reasons why I put in the relationship inventory, I want you to step back. I want you to see an objective view of the relationship by looking at that, by looking at the ambivalence. There were things about this person you liked. There were things about this person you didn't like. And if you've been in a relationship with somebody who is personality disordered, there's going to be a lot that you don't like but it also requires a lot of denial to stay in those relationships most of those relationships when you start to uncover the relationship the words the sentences the verbal abuse the abandonment the absolute toyful manipulation that they do with the their partners when you look at those disordered relationships You sometimes wonder, how can somebody still find good in that person? If you couldn't, you wouldn't be with them. I always tell people that because they'll say, well, you know, the person said this, they said that, they were really nice to me on this day or that day. They have to be nice to you now and again, otherwise you wouldn't be with them ever. I mean, they're hoping that you will accept the breadcrumbs that they're throwing you. So even in the most disordered relationship, there will be good things that are hard to get beyond. Freud's most important work came from his ability to understand the dual nature of human relationship. And Abraham, Carl Abraham, agreed with Freud and said that he believed that people got stuck on it, on their ambivalence towards somebody who just passed away and they get stuck in their process right there because they don't want to admit the parts of the person they don't like. 
in order for you to move on, it's important for you to recognize everything about this person, good, bad, and indifferent. You cannot move on until you absolutely know what it was you had and what it was you didn't have. 20 years after Freud published Morning and Melancholia, Helen Deutsch wrote The Absence of Grief. And her paper explored the manifestation of unexpressed grieving. And it was the first paper to connect self-defeating behaviors with unresolved grief. She looked at people who were stuck in grief and how they behave and how their behavior was basically them acting out their grief or their unresolved grief. And that's a lot of times when we find ourselves in chaotic relationships. We will be running from pillar to post because we don't want to feel as bad as we really feel. And we don't want to feel the pain and the loss that we've had before this relationship, before this breakup, before this person. We don't want to look at all that. So we keep running from pillar to post. So when Helen Deutsch was talking about an absence of grief, she was talking about when you just suppress it. After Helen Deutsch wrote An Absence of Grief, Eric Lindemann wrote Management of Acute Grief in the Journal of American Psychiatry. Took a look at 100 clinical cases, which was the most comprehensive sampling done up until that point. And he said that successful resolution of grief depends mainly on the commitment to actively working through grief in spite of the intense emotion brought up by that work. And that is what Lindemann said is necessary for successful mourning, that it's about holding on and seeing it through even when it's difficult and that's what Freud said when he was talking about great cathartic energy he was talking about the crying he was talking about not eating not sleeping a feeling that you're not living life normally Freud recognized that he said even though it seems as far away from real life as you can get or normal living as you can get, it's not a malady. That the way you feel, the way you're crying, the way you're absent-minded, the way you're confused, the way you're anxious, the way you're hurt, the way you're everything, it's all normal. And Lindemann, in studying the clinical cases that he was looking at, He coined the term grief work in the 1940s. And yet most people don't even know what that is or what it looks like. And Eric Lindemann said that there were three reactions. There is seeing the grief process all the way through, which includes being able to tolerate the great emotional upheaval. And then there's a delayed reaction and a distorted reaction. In a delayed reaction, grieving is set aside sometimes for days, weeks, months, sometimes even years. In a distorted reaction, other things come up as a result of the unresolved grieving. It could be hypochondria. It could be some sort of attention getting device. There could be other ways that people become very stuck in their grief and they just stay there. Eric Lindemann and Helen Deutsch both also said that no reaction is pathological. And one of the things that people always say to me is, what does it mean when my ex went on to the next person tra la 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 and they're running off into the sunset as if nothing happened what does that mean problem is that we are rewarded for doing that eric lindemann back in the 1940s said that people are said to be doing well when they have no affect or they don't engage in any displays of emotion. He said that we are giving people credit for not doing anything at all after they've had a loss. We are rewarding the wrong stuff. Now, he said that in the 1940s and nothing has really changed. 
Because sorrow in others generally makes us feel uncomfortable because most of us don't know what to say or do around somebody who's expressing sorrow. So we will not challenge somebody who's not having a a grief reaction. We not only won't challenge it, we will commend it. Oh, hey, he or she's doing really well. They, they they don't even look like anything happened. They lost the love of their life. And hey, they're just trawling along. Isn't that great? That's fabulous. But that's what people would like you to do. The inability to allow grief to just happen is what leads to its subsequent appearance as pathological behavior. We see it years later. After World War II... A theorist named Charles Anderson studied soldiers returning home from World War II. They had been diagnosed with what they called battle fatigue. Anderson said it was not battle fatigue, but it was their inability to mourn their losses while out on the battlefield. And post-traumatic stress disorder also keeps them frozen. What we called battle fatigue, we now call PTSD. But it's a mixture of survivor's guilt and frozen grief. Charles Anderson said that 60%, and this is a high number, he said 60% of his patients were living with crushing, debilitating depression. And what he was noticing as a trauma response in the soldiers that were coming back he said was a necessary survival technique like they needed to push all their feelings about everything that was going on down inside in order to survive the war so they were not able to express anything i mean you're not going to sit there in the middle of battlefield and start crying because your best buddy has been blown up right next to you but that's what happens is they have these traumatic experiences they don't get to emote about them because they have to they have to be careful about saving their life their own lives and the lives of the people that they're fighting with and then when they come out of the war they just want to stop they don't want to think about it Charles Anderson said the post-war scene is studded with innumerable hamlets unable to live in peace without those they have lost nor yet able to live in peace with the memories and images they carry within. This is somebody who's frozen in grief. Charles Anderson thought that what he saw in his patients was clinical depression and that his patients were racked with survivor guilt, suicidal ideation, and hysterical symptoms such as the somatic killing off of parts of their bodies. In the 1950s, the pain of mourning became the focal point of human development researcher John Bowlby. He studied development and personality in terms of object relations theory, which is what Freud's theory is about the object is the loved one john bowlby studied freud and he agreed with freud that the sorrow inherent in the work of mourning is a result of the inability of the ego to give up its objects meaning its loved ones and without that surrender the reordering of reality cannot take place however bowlby was determined to find out why it was so hard to achieve he said that if detaching was so important but so difficult then learning about how humans attach must be vital to mourning theory and that is how john bowlby's attachment theory and mourning theory came together He started studying attachment by studying the effects of young children taken from their mothers and placed with strangers in unfamiliar surroundings. Bowlby described their reactions as one of protest and urgent effort to recover the lost mother. He called these alarm reactions that the children had in response to being separated from their parents. And he noticed that this alarm reaction involved disbelief followed by searching, a heightened fear response, protesting by way of crying, 
intense emotional distress and searching. The response that the children had in response to their mother going away mimicked the human grief process if allowed to happen without any restriction. If you were to have a loss and you just allowed your grief to come and come naturally, which you should because it is a normal and natural response to loss, if you just let it happen, you would experience what the children experienced. In the beginning, you would feel some sort of disbelief or shock. You will start to feel anxious. You will start to understand the situation where the situation is not a happy one. You think about the children. You think about their looking for their parents. Usually when they do these working with kids around nine months to a year, that's usually when they have the most severe response to this. So what Bowlby realized children do is they have this alarm reaction. Then they have a heightened fear reaction and they're protesting, they're crying, they're having a lot of emotional distress. They're looking for their parent. They want to know where their parent is. After a while, the child kind of pulls back into this kind of resigned state of hypervigilance. Like he's looking, looking, looking for the mother... But the hypervigilance is getting less and less intense. And this is what you see when children are starting to resign themselves to the fact that mother's not coming back. And the child becomes very upset and very lifeless. They exhibit a somewhat depressive tinge to them. There's this in-between part where the child becomes very hypersensitive to noises to sounds to things coming in and out where is it mother is it mother is this let this is when the child is trying to keep from sliding into hopelessness and despair and this sounds terrible but this is basically the human reaction the lost loved one and the child when left to their own devices will engage in the normal human state of mourning and it will just happen as it needs to happen for a while the child is observed to be on an emotional roller coaster where great anticipation is offset by great sorrow you'll see the child hear noise pipe up look around get real wide-eyed and then no that's not mother and they become sort of depressed again what John Bowlby noticed was that as time goes on the affective state starts to become less and less the child is showing less and less emotion as they're becoming resigned to the situation at hand and it's not a happy situation the child starts to withdraw emotionally and this correlates to the middle period of mourning when the psyche is struggling between holding on and letting go the inability to resolve this middle phase is what leads to depression so in the In the studies that John Bowlby and Mary Answorth did on development, they see that children, when separated from their parent, they go through the grief process, the letting go process, as the human mind is set up to do it. One of the things that's really important is to understand that when you have a loss, the normal and natural response to loss is grief. The human mind decides what it needs to do in order to get you through this loss and into the rest of your life. And I can't stress enough that even though It's a grave departure from normal life. It's still not a malady. Please remember that. Even though you probably feel like I am never going to be normal again, please know that you are having a normal and natural response to loss. If you don't believe it at first, you may go in and out of disbelief a few times, but eventually you get to the middle part of grief where it is the great emotional bloodletting. So John Bowlby looked at the issues that humans have in detaching through the work of grief, which led him 
to try to understand how humans attach. John Bowlby and Mary Answorth said that the early formation of the bonds with those around you influences all later relationships and failure to form healthy bonds can be passed through a family. And I used that in my undergraduate thesis when I was talking about how the the psychic wound of being descended from slaves in Song of Solomon and the psychic wound of life on the reservation in ceremony and the psychic wound of having to deal with your father, good Irish daughter in final payments. I used all of those generational bonds to show that grief is absolutely an intragenerational thing. And in studying ethnic literature, I was able to see how unresolved grief and sort of the sins of the father continue to be revisited on the current generation when these things are not resolved. And attachment relationships play a key role in the transgenerational transmission of deprivation. Pathological attachments are usually the result of early overattachment or underattachment to primary caretakers. And if anyone knows the story of Song of Solomon, they know that the main character, Milkman, was breastfed by his mother for many years beyond what he should have been, which is how he got his nickname. But that attachment is central to that story. Bowlby likened the emotional system to the biological and physiological processes that keep body temperature within a certain range to prevent hypo and hyperthermia. This is what we talk about when we're talking about affirmations and comfort zones and all of those things that we talk about in our affirmation studies because we really need to understand it. When environmental stresses cause extreme body temperature and threaten the ability of the body to achieve homostasis, acute physical distress is the result. Similarly, when attachment bonds are threatened, the emotional system experiences personal distress. The anguish experienced when separated from the attachment figure is designed first and foremost to get the attachment figure back and to restore a sense of security and safety. However, if the bonds are not consistent, the child grows anxious or ambivalent. And that is a pattern that's followed throughout life. And I'm doing a group in January, or I'm going to start talking to the group in January. I probably start the group mid-January, early February. I'm going to be doing a group on attachment and abandonment. And I really want to talk to people because I want to talk about anxious attachment and avoidant attachment because those are the things that will set you up for what kind of attachment style you have in life. And then that attachment style will dictate how you get into and out of relationships. Colin Murray Park studied widows and he wrote about the fluidity of grief, which again, that belies any analogy to anything in stages. Colin Murray Pox talked about the fluidity of grief and he called it a process and not a state. And when he studied the widows, he found the same things that Bowlby found in children. That after the initial stage of realizing a loss has occurred, a, an urge to search develops. Colin Murray Pox studied Conrad Lorenz, who studied the great lag Goose. And people who know my work know that the gray lag goose mates for life. And what Lorenz found with the geese was even if the goose is killed right in front of its partner and its dead body is there, the goose that is still living will fly great distances looking for the lost loved one. Even though the goose sees the dead 
partner on the ground, it doesn't compute. It doesn't get it. The goose doesn't understand that the partner that I care so much for is this thing laying on the ground. Their partner is still alive and well, and they're going to go find them. They often fly great distances and even get hurt, maimed, or even killed on these fruitless journeys. So Colin Murray Parks found that widows would look in a crowd for their husbands. They would go to call them on the phone. They would do a lot of things that you would think that a person who understood that their husband is dead, they buried them weeks later, and now they're out at the store putting stuff for them to cook for them in the shopping cart. And the widows knew that the husband was dead. So what was going on? This is called the searching mechanism. And when we are in a breakup and we start to feel the searching mechanism and we want to start creeping someone's Facebook page, we want to look at their Instagram, we want to start putting out little doodads so that we could find them, you know, somewhere on the internet. That's the searching mechanism. We want to put the world back together the way it belongs. And that's what it's about. When the goose is looking for their partner, they want their world to go back the way they know it to be. They do not want a dead partner. They cannot comprehend a dead partner. They just want things back the way they used to be. When the widow's looking for the husband in the crowd, they the mind just wants to put it back the way it used to be. The mind isn't giving you good, bad, and different. They're not saying, well, if this person was really bad for you, you wouldn't be thinking about them. That's not how it works. The mind isn't making any judgment calls on your ex. The mind isn't saying, well... They're not that bad, so I'm going to let you miss miss him or her. No, the mind is just playing the endless loop, the movie, the tape, whatever it is you want to call it in your head because it is doing the necessary psychological process called review and relinquishment. Your brain is trying to put the world back the way it knows it to be. That's what the searching mechanism is all about. But when it can't do that, when it fails at that, it then goes on to reorder the world to take this loss into consideration. So you have to keep going. Colin Murray Parks said that grief is not a simple stressor. He likened grief to physical trauma and he said that the loss can be spoken of like a blow and the wound gradually heals. But if the healing is interrupted or not completed, further blows will reopen it and make it worse. And that's what happens when we don't resolve our grief. We stop and then when we have a new loss, it opens it up. But we don't know that that's what's going on. We think that this new loss that we have, this breakup that we have, and suddenly we're having this big catastrophic response to it with thinking oh my goodness I must have loved him or her a lot no it has nothing to do with love it has to do with the fact that grief is just difficult one of the reasons why I really dislike the word stages is because it really gives people a misunderstanding of what's actually going on Dead grieving is really a series of phases. It represents some of the processes of adaptation to loss. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Grief Observed, and I always suggest that people read this book. It's a very short book. C.S. Lewis was a well-known theologian. He was very famous. There was a movie called Shadowlands with Anthony Hopkins, and it was just a great movie. But The thing that I like about A Grief Observed is that you can see C.S. Lewis is a very religious man. He's a theologian. He takes his faith very seriously. And you see a complete breakdown of his faith in this book. And then you eventually see him bring, come back to his understanding of God. It's an incredible book for one that's as, as short as it is. And compared to so many of his great works, it's very short and to the point and a great book. But he said in grief, nothing stays put. One keeps on emerging from a phase 
but it always recurs round and round everything repeats am i going in circles or dare i hope that i am on a spiral but if i am on a spiral am i going up or am i coming down it is really important for people to recognize the back and forth progression of grief because if you don't then that's just going to be another obstacle to completing the grief. You have to understand that many times you're going to have passed a, a stage and you're going to wind up right back there again. And sometimes people even will intellectually understand it. They will understand, yes, I understand. I have to go back there again. I have to put my time in, my grief time in. I understand that. I understand grief. I understand it's a phase. I understand I need to do it again. And then when it comes around, you're like, I I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I don't want to do this. I don't feel like doing this. I don't want to cry today. I just don't. Sometimes you can have a day like that and it just becomes chronic where you never get back to the grief. So you can have days like that where you say, no more. I'm done. I don't want to cry today. I don't want to have a bad day. I don't want to be sad I don't want to be sorrowful I don't want to be anything and that's okay but you have to get back to the grief every one of the theorists that talk about unresolved mourning said that the morbid reactions to loss are so prevalent that it's sometimes difficult to understand exactly what healthy grieving is and how it happens now let's go to the lady herself Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said, and this is the thing that she said that people should be hanging on to. Instead of trying to reverse engineer Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of death and dying to fit grief, why don't we look at what she said about grief? Maybe we should do that. That's an idea. So she said that people need to understand that grief will happen either as an open healing wound or a closed festering wound either honestly or dishonestly either appropriately or inappropriately but emotions will be expressed she said the inability to resolve a lifetime of loss can result in many manifestations of neuroses so if you let it happen, it will happen. It will happen the way it happened with the little children. Mom goes away. You'll go through all those different. But as long as you don't give up on grief and go into a state of melancholia that you can't get out of, you can complete the grief. Even if it's many years after the loss, it's never too late to resolve a loss. John Bowlby said that people who don't resolve a loss will suffer from depression, insomnia, nightmares, empty personal relationships, and, an, and a sense of unreality. That is not something that you want to be tasked with. Oh, hi, I'll have some, I'll have a sense of unreality. <laughs> I mean, it was like, nobody's going to sign up for that. But unresolved grief can lead to alcoholism, drug abuse, severe forms of mental illness, depression and suicide and that's where the unreality comes in you have to understand what healthy mourning is and how it happens 